I trust that as we have been going through, you have been edified and um, are learning more about our church. And tonight we are going to continue from where we had left off the last time. And we were just finishing tenant number five. And we are about to begin tenant number six. Anyone out there knows tenant number six by heart without looking at your tenant card? Okay, I don't see any raise of hand. But anyhow, it's um, let me read it for you, number six. The nine gifts of the Holy Ghost for the edification, exhortation, and comfort of the church. So that is the nine gifts of the Holy Ghost for the edification, exhortation, and comfort of the church which is the body of christ the church which is the body of christ christ is the head and the church is the body and for our scripture reading we are going to turn to first corinthians chapter 12 and we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 11. First Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 1 through to verse 11. And I believe if we reach, read even verse 12, it will help us. So let's begin. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that ye were Gentiles carried away with these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God call it Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit, and to another, gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, diverse kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these work it that one and the self same spirit divide into every man severally as he will. Let's look at number 12. For as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Praise the Lord. So you heard dear mention all the nine gifts of the spirit to the church. Now let me just look at a few verses, verse four 
to verse 7. It said, now there are diversities of the gifts, but the same spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one that giveth all these gifts. It's not one, one like Jesus giving out a gift, the Holy Spirit giving out a gift, and the Father giving, no. The Holy Spirit, all the gifts them come from him, and he is the one that work through the individual with these gifts to get the work of the Lord being done. When it says there are di differences of administration, but the same Lord, you might find that even in, our, in the Pentecostal circle, there are some churches that they are Pentecostal, but their, their way of administration might be different. It was just over the weekend I was talking to a fellow co-worker who is a Christian, and she was telling me that in her church, they don't have any deaconess. And I was saying, why? She said, there is, there is no deaconess in the Bible. And I said, okay. So in their administration, they don't have deaconess. They believe in having deacons, but they don't believe in deaconess. They have what they would call um, a woman's president instead. So some churches in diff the, the administrative section difference differs. For example, you might have a church that their, what we would consider to be our superintendent or president of the work. They call him the bishop. The bishop and the bishop is the high calling in their setting. When in our setting, we would say the, the, um, the president is the, the main person in charge. Others say differently. So you may have different of, of, um, administration, but the same Lord, we are serving the same Lord. And there, there are diversities, verse six, of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Praise the Lord. So we're going to get right into it now. And um, let me just read a little prelude before we get into each of the different gifts. So the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit are described in this chapter that I read earlier. They are very special deposits of supernatural ability given by the Holy Ghost to believers for the blessing of the church. They are not to be used for self-advancement or prominence, nor to be treated as some abnormal and occasional phenomena which appear when there is a time of revival, then disappear and the church returns to normality. They are intended to be a permanent means of blessing in all the assemblies of God's people until the coming of the Lord. Okay, um, forgive me. I did not remember to turn on my electronic Bible so I can get to some of the scriptures so that we can read them together and um, see exactly where they, where, what, what they are saying. So I'm getting that turned on right now as we speak. So we can get right into some of the scriptures here. And the first scripture that I'd like to, us to look at today is 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12. Even so ye, 
for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, see that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. So here it is confirming with what I just read. The gifts are not something for your own glorification. It's not something for your own personal advancement. It's not your master's degree that's going to land you that big job. But it is something that must edify the church. The body of Christ must be benefited from your gift. You know, sometimes some people, God give them a gift. And before they stay in the church and use that gift for the, for the as the scripture say, for the edification, exhortation, and the comfort of the church. No, they turn aside and go and set up something to, to use the gift there as a means of enhancing themselves. But God did not give us that the gift for that. It is for the edification of the church. Let's look at also 1 Corinthians 13. And let's read from verse 9. 9 to 12. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then all that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I speak as a child. I understood as a child. I taught as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through our glass, glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. You see, there's coming a time when even all of what we we, we, we think we know. You know, Pastor Campbell loves to say, they think they know, but they don't even know that they don't know. <laughs> you know, but we'll in part now, but there's coming a time, man, brethren, there's coming a time when we, we, we're going to be like Jesus. We're going to know as we were known. You won't have to say, I wonder. You know, you know the thing. Because that's the place we are heading on, the, the statue of the perfect man. So these gifts are to be distinguished from a list given in Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8. Let me finish reading and then we'll turn to it. Where the emphasis is not on the function or the place of the gift, but on the character faith and humility of the person being used in various ways. Similar, these nine gifts are distinct from the five ministry gifts that is found in the apostolic book, the apostolic chapter, and the apostolic verse, where the gifts are not abilities, but men in whom ministerial functions are resident by the headship of Christ. So let's look at Romans 12. Verses 6 to 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith, our ministry, let us wait on, a, on our ministering, or him that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorted on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, that he show it mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one towards another. When brotherly love, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in prayer, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, and continuing instant in prayer. So these gifts that we are talking about here is not, not this. These, these that are just read here, these are not what we are talking about. We are talking about the gifts given by the spirit and this is this over here is kind of telling us how we are to be when we we, we we work in 
um, the, when we in the gift that God we must lord it over people because God gives you the gift of prophecy. Every person you book up, you have a prophecy if you tell them. You must wait on your prophecy, wait before God and make God fill you up. It's not what you think or what you want to tell them. Wait on God. You must be you must be humble for the Lord and let the Lord work because it's the, it's the Spirit doing the work through you. You are just a channel, a vessel in the hand of God who God has put his Spirit in. And at the appropriate time, God, the Holy Spirit, will use you to, to, to exercise that gift for the edification, exaltation, and comfort of the church. So the gifts are given in three ways. A gift or a gift may be given directly by the Lord to an individual who earnestly seek for such. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1 and 13. When this gift is received, this gift will be recognized by the presbytery as it is used in the local church. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and let's read verse 1 follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts but rather that ye may prophesy so paul was saying here that is a is a very good gift to desire so nothing no wrong when you want to desire to be a prophet in the body of christ it is something that you can seek the Lord for. You can ask the Lord for. And if the Lord, if it is the Lord's desire, he can, he can, as it were, impart this gift to you by the Holy Spirit so that it can be used for the comfort of the church, not for your own personal gain. And the gift must be recognized by the local presbytery. So don't because... You feel you have the gift. Oh, well, the presbytery have to go here when me say no, because me attack God's mind and them, them no say me can me, 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 me prophesy. So 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 me just come now, come prophesy and in the middle of service, you just start to prophesy. No, it's not like that. You must be under leadership, you must be under the covering of the leadership of the church. You can't just be 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 be, be, be just going off like that. No, everything the scripture says must be done decently and in order. Second now, a prophetic message may reveal a gift to an individual. Sorry, may reveal a gift in an individual. And this will be confirmed by the laying on of hands of, of an apostle and the presbytery. Let's look at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 4, verse 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy and the laying on of hands of the presbytery. You understand? So this was Paul speaking to a young man in the church and was saying said neglect not the gift that is in thee which, which was given thee by prophecy so the lord can prophesy through a channel give the word of prophecy or the spirit of prophecy and the lord the holy spirit causes this person to speak and say we I call such and such as a prophet in the body of Christ and the apostle and the local presbytery. They meet, they meet counsel with the Lord, counsel with one another, and then they call the individual, speak to the individual. And if that individual is humble and 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 and, and um, humble before the Lord and accepts, they can lay hands upon them and that gift is imparted to them and the Lord will use them in the body of Christ. The third way, an apostle may receive a revelation of a gift and impart it to an individual. You know, sometimes I miss the old days. I miss the old days. Yes, man, I miss the old days. 
You know why? I remember in the old days, the apostle would come and he'd sit and he'd wait. And after the, 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 the spirit of the Lord move and the prophet speaks, he would get up and sometimes sometime you would hear him say, I was waiting on that word to confirm what the, the thing that the Lord had revealed in his spirit. Yeah, man, I miss those days. So the apostle can receive that revelation and he holds that revelation until the, 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 the prophet, it, is, it comes through the prophet because, you know, the, the scriptures say, I, I think it's established between two or three witnesses. So the, the, the apostle keeps that and he wants to know if it is the will of God or the mind of God and he waits until the, the, the prophet or the Lord bring it out and through prophecy that it is of such. So we can seek for these gifts, but in the final analysis, it is the decision of the Holy Spirit that the gifts are imparted. So it, the, the, the gifts only, the, 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 the servants of God can lay them hand, but it, it, it is the Holy Spirit that is imparting the gift, not man. We can now set our understanding of these gifts. The gift of the word of wisdom. Now, in some settings, they group the gifts into three categories. Gifts of revelation, gifts of inspiration, and gifts of power. But I'm going to go through each of them as we are here this evening. So the gift of the word of wisdom. This is not human wisdom. Wisdom which is the result of informed experience, usually over, I'm, 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 sorry, I have to go fight again. I left out a vital word. Human wisdom is the result of informed experience, usually over many years. Christian wisdom is, the given, is given in response to our prayer. James 1, 5, and James 3, 17. But this gift is the word of wisdom for the church. Wisdom is always needed in times of decision and crisis. And this, given, this gift is given so that when an individual is seeking counsel or a local church is in an impasse or a fellowship is in a conflict, then a word can be supernaturally given which solves the problem which has baffled the best of human wisdom. This is clearly seen in Acts chapter 6 in the instruction given to remedy the crisis in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem church. The crisis in the church is generally about circumcision. You know, there was this crisis because back before Christ's time, circumcision was a must. But after Christ, some was going on as if say circumcision was still necessary. And some was saying, no, it's not necessary because the apostles recognize now that Christ come and die. So that, that old time um, thing that they used to follow is not necessary anymore. So it brought crisis. So the word of wisdom was there given. And there was one statement in James 19 that solved the whole situation and put an end to all that debate. Only divine wisdom can do that. So men can sit down and have their talk and they can reason and they can even what they call in the old days chaos lots to figure out a solution to the problem. When Joshua was in charge and AI defeat them, the, 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 the scripture said they cast a lot and the lot fell on Achan and when they call up Achan, the fear of God caused Achan to talk the truth. 
but now the Holy Spirit oh, can give one individual the word of wisdom that can sort out problem or things that is causing division and as it were causing people to be of different opinion. The word of wisdom can do that. The gift of knowledge. And I'm sorry I have to be going through, but I really would like to get through all nine of them before the time is out. As with the previous gift, this is not the result of education or experience, but it is a God-given ability to know that which is hidden from all men and to express this revelation in a word communicated to the church. It is a most demanding gift, for it usually involves the unveiling of that which people have kept hidden in the depths of their personality while seeking to present themselves as the opposite of what they really are. Peter used this gift when meeting two deceivers in Acts 5 who tried to lie to the Holy Spirit. Paul used it at Cyprus in Acts 13 verse 10 in revealing the true nature and purpose as one who tried to pass off himself as a prophet. You remember the one in Acts? You remember the one in Acts chapter 5? Anybody remember Acts chapter 5? Your Bible is right here, you know, you can't turn and look for it. All right, let me help you a little bit. Let's look at Acts chapter 5. And as you read the verse 1, you say, oh, yes, pastor, I know the whole story. You see, sometimes when we're talking here, we have to give you the hard truth. We can't talk it too nice. But Ananias and Sapphira, two of them decide to make their contribution, but they wasn't going to give everything. They was going to hold back apart. And the two of them decided and planned the thing that one would go first and one would come in way after. And we all know what happened to them. And here again in Acts 13, and I think we talked about it last week, where that prophet was had the whole people spellbound. And when him see what's going on, him want to come purchase. He said, man, sell me some of the Holy Spirit. Man, because that thing's powerful. It has also been used many times in the realm of divine healing. By this gift, the nature of needs can be revealed. Their location, duration, and termination. Paul used this gift at Lystra when he knew that a total stranger had faith to be healed. Acts 14, verse 9, and expressed in a word of what the gift had revealed to him. Let's turn to that quickly. And, and let's read from verse 8 to get the, the full understanding. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, whom had never walked the same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceived that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Oh, my God. Whoa. So if the word of knowledge even the word of knowledge can be used to heal. Let's look, up, look at the gift of faith. All believers have saving faith. 
every one of us. Because to become a believer, you must do what? You must believe. You must believe. For none can be a Christian without it. It is by this same faith that we continue in the will of God. This special gift of faith is not for the individual, but for the church. So that obstacles, whether human, human, hu human or demonic, in the way of the progress of the church, locally and universally may be removed. No doubt, someone in the prayer meeting in Acts was exercising this gift with the result that the imprisoned apostle was miraculously set free. You remember that one? When they locked up the apostle and they were there in the church praying and next thing they know, the same person that we're praying for was knocking at the door that when one believer look out and see him, she went back and tell them I never ever record. It's like, she just say, listen, him out the door and knocking you know. I'm winning a prayer for him out the door. Right now. They never ever realize, but somebody had the faith to believe. True faith always result in freedom. And the exercise of this gift should have been a great liberating effect on all other ministers, ministries, and function of the church. Listen, man, when you when we have faith to believe God, it's a it, it's a liberating thing. You, you remember when Jesus was going to heal, heal that man's daughter, and the news met him part way and say, Nobody met the man come. She did. Where Jesus turned to the man and said, only believe, man. You don't pay where you're here, no man. You don't take that. Just believe. Have faith. You come in with Jesus. Come on now. Jesus, I walk side of you. If you come, come, come do something. And somebody got to listen. But about the master guy to over now. Where you going to do? Tell Jesus, say, boy, is that right? Okay, I do nothing more. Come on, man. Believe. We must believe. So, true faith, it can be exercised in prayer, privately or publicly, to the pulling down of strongholds. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 10 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, mighty true God to the pulling down of the stronghold. Verse 5, casting down imagination and everything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. We, as God's people, when we exercise our faith, God can do the miraculous. God can, the thing where everybody's saying is hopeless and impossible. I give you the story every time. Certain thing, everybody coming back and say, the man said the same thing. No position, no vacancy, no job not there. And when everybody gone and I go in, I hear a different story. <laughs> Some people get up and when they hear the first man come out with it, they left. They never want to hear anything more. But I sit there and I wait to the last because I say, I can't be like them. God sent me down here for a reason and I must have to prove God. And when I get in there, it was a different story. It was a different story when we have faith in God. Gifts of healing. Jesus promises a ministry of healing to accompany the preaching of the gospel. And this is found in Mark 16, verse 15 to 20. The elders have to be specially commissioned to be used in this way. James 5, verse 14 to 15. Let us read that one, James 5.
Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. And if he had committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. So, so God has given this ministry, especially to the elders of the church. Beyond this ministry, the Holy Spirit deposits the gifts of healing in individuals so they can be used as instruments of the divine physician as he continues his ministry among men. Note the plural, plural, plurality of this function to meet the diversities of human affliction. And there's a whole heap of scripture here. I can only give them out. Acts 3, 2, 8, 7, 14, 19 to 20, 19, 12, and 20, 10. And in Acts 28, 8 to 9. When these gifts are revealed in the local church, the presbytery should give opportunity to the gifted persons irrespective of sex to minister healing as the need arises so so it is it, 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 it's, it's not just for the prayer it's not it's the gifts don't given to the pastors and the elders alone any individual the lord can work through the lord can work through them and and, and impart gifts of healing and cause persons to be healed from sicknesses from diseases, all different types of suffering that afflict man. God can work through the Holy Spirit, can work through individuals, and these persons that are with have illnesses can be healed in the name of Jesus. The working of miracles. Healing can involve the restoration of a physical function which has been diseased, injured, or never developed. A miracle is the over is overriding the laws of nature and is shown in the life of Jesus by turning water into wine instantaneously. Is walking on the water. That was another, what was another, another miracle? Because we all know you can't walk on water, but Jesus did it. On the reversal of death, remember when he raised the dead and other miraculous acts, the working of miracles can be the creation of that which did not exist before. Remember the, the, the cripple man that them say if I name born him is a cripple. It never it never walked before. But the power of God through the Holy Spirit can cause miracles to happen. The power of God affecting the natural world or the preserving power of God manifesting through those who possess this gift. It is seen in operation in Acts 8 when Philip was, Philip is transported a considerable distance by divine power. Let's look at it, Acts chapter 8. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. You remember the story where Philip met this eunuch and, and after having a conversation, he took him down to the water and baptized him. And here it is, by the time he baptized him, Philip was caught up. The spirit of the Lord took him away that the eunuch all him looking. He don't know where him gone. But he had a need. 
and God provided Philip right at the, that point of his need. And Philip ministered to him. And the water was there. And he said, what prevents you from being baptized? And he baptized him and God took him away. In Acts 9, verse 41, Dorcas is restored to life. In Acts 6, 26, in an earthquake, every prison door was open. Chains fell off from every prisoner. Now, you know, if, if, if these are not miracles, you can just imagine men in shackles in pain in prison, shackles and chains, and they, they are bound. And these things, sometimes when you look at the key that have to open these things, man, man can't get away. But just at, with an earthquake, God used, and every door flung open, every chain fell off. That when the, the water of the prison came and he saw what happened, the man back him knife to take his own life. And they had to shout to him and say, wait, wait, we're still here. We don't go on. Don't bother kill yourself. Miracle. Miracle. Now let's look at the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy can be received by both men and women. So it's not a male-dominated gift. It is a gift for both men and women. Through this gift, the Holy Spirit uses a person to bring a direct message from the Lord to the local church in their own language. It is not for private or family use, but for the church. It does not matter where the church is gathered, in a home, in a hall, at a convention, or any other form of gathering. Even online, even online, the Lord speak to us, don't we witness it? Right and line. We're not at church, but the Lord speak to us right and line. Providing the local presbytery is in charge, making the occasion official as far as the local church is concerned. That is why we insist that the voice gifts in general shall not be used in local youth meetings men's meeting or women's meeting as these meetings are not meetings of the whole church and that is what i grew up and know no prophecy in the yp no prophecy in the men's meeting no prophecy in the women's meeting because the whole church is not there the local presbytery is not the person in charge of those sessions, when the local presbytery is there, it's, it's a different thing. Due to human feeling, the exercise of this gift was being abused in, in current so that the Holy Spirit gave the following directions for the wise use of this most precious gift. One, it must be exercised in love. Prophecy is not a gift for, for, for beat up people. Prophecy is not a gift for make people who have left the church. It's a gift that must be exercised in love. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. There can be no more than three messages should be given in any one service. So when we meet for service and prophecy start, it not turn to a prophecy meeting. Everybody come with a prophecy. It's not so. Everything must be done decently and in order and your most we must have is three so anytime you hear the fourth, the fourth person talking tell them to shut up they must be instructed to keep quiet because you don't even don't digest the first and the second and the third you more, much more you're going on to a fourth one because prophecy must be judged The Holy Spirit know that there's a limit to what the human mind can take in at one time. So you just see how the Holy Spirit intelligent. He know what the limit with limitations are. Sometimes I tell the truth, I have a problem for try to jot down all the prophecy, the amount of the prophecy some of the time. 
Sometimes many I need to pass me by because while I'm writing, something else going over and I, I can't get everything. So there's a limit. The utterance must be examined as to whether it is of God or not. So sometimes when we say, we move on and we don't give any expounding on the prophecy, we're still in the judgment phase. We're still at the point of perusing over it. The apostolic church does not believe or teach that prophecy is infallible. We adhere to the injunction, despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. This judging, proving, and testing must be done by the local presbytery in accordance with these principles. Here are the principles. And I want us to listen carefully to the principle so you can understand what is happening. The person used must be known to be living a godly life. Second Peter 1 verse 2. Let us look at that scripture. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Secondly, the message must not contradict the written word. That is one of the quickest, and I believe Elder love to use this one. This is one of the quickest way to judge the prophecy. If the prophecy has said go stone and go kill, and God said we must love the word of God, said we must love. We have to yield to the word of God. So the prophecy must be backed up by the word of God. If the prophecy don't back up by the word of God, we cast it out. There must be a witness of the spirit of God. Sorry, let me read it again. There must be a witness of the spirit in God's servants to the anointing of the prophecy. So there must be a witness in our spirit. The spirit must be a witness with the prophetic word that just come forth. If, if, it, if, it, if it not be no witness in our spirit, Chances are we won't give no exhortation. We won't say anything on it. If it is a predictive word and does not come to pass, the word is not from God. It must be born in the mind, however, that much of the predictive is controversial and also that the predictive words may sometimes take many years before they are fulfilled. So sometimes we may get a word that tells us that in the future and sometime coming, this and this will happen. And we'll have to sit and we'll have to wait. And we will use the time to judge whether it's of the Lord or not. For some of you, you may remember when Pastor Weatherburn was among us. I remembered. He prophesied about Falmouth. He spoke that some things were going to be happening down at Falmouth. And guess what happened? We live to see the same thing that the man prophesied come to pass. You understand? So we can say, we can know say it was a true word, a prophecy. And there were others too. I might not remember, but I remember that one in particular. Sometimes even the prophet have to, I think the prophet sometimes have a difficult time, you know, because when they, when they, when they become impregnated with God's word to speak and they, 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 they must be wondering to themselves, oh, oh, can I say these things? But if they're the Lord leading them, 
and the Holy Spirit, it is done through all the right way, then it will come to pass. You don't have to fret about it. There should be no sense of competition between channels. If you have a word of the Lord, and before you can speak, you hear another channel start to speak. Don't rush to get your word out there. Wait is of God, your chance will come, wait. But if you have to speak while the other person has speak, because you feel say your word more important is not of God. God is not a competition. God is not the author of confusion. The person prophesying is in control of when or for how long he or she speaks. They are not taken over by the Holy Spirit. As in the case of the de de demonic, in, a, in, the, in the case of demonic manifestation, when the human personality is suspended, the emphasis this sorry this emphasizes the responsibility of those with the gift to use it properly and in accordance with divine instruction as well as divine inspiration it must continually be born in the mind that the gift has a threefold purpose it is for the edifying of the church. The edifying means the building up of God's people. It is for the exhortation of the church. That is to stir up the people of God. It is for the comfort of the church. Cheering up the people of God. That is what prophecy is about. And the prophet must constantly bear this thing in mind. Constantly bear it in mind. Government and direction are not within the scope of this gift, but are in the sphere and the office. Are it, sorry, but are the sphere and office of the function of the said prophet. All right, let me read that last part again. Government and direction are not within the scope of this gift. So if the Lord use you to bring a word of prophecy, when it comes to governmental things of the church, concerning the church, government and direction, those fall under the office of the set profit understand right so it's not like um the, it's like the minister then the minister of health him in this covid thing he must give direction and the little nurse we're giving out the injection she can go and make some say okay we're gonna send 20 bucks go a, a, a spanish town health center she can't do that. The minister theme, a theme decision that her decision vaccinate them 10 people before you. That are your duty. So it's the same way. Do you get the you, you have the, the, the Lord use you to, to speak? You speak within that that those confines. But if you hear say the the the, the um, certain governmental direction and decisions to be taken those are the said prophet the said prophet have that responsibility let's now look at the gifts of the discerning of spirits right this one was a tight one to try getting all of them for tonight but let me try careful note should be made that this is not mere not human discernment or intuition which by some may possess, which some may possess to a reasonable degree. 
it is the deposit of an ability to uncover the activity of evil spirit when they are seeking to deceive the church in some way. Satan will seek to pass off himself as an angel of light. And it was by deception that he ruined the human race in the Garden of Eden. So it is essential in the churches moving in a spiritual activity that there should be people with the ability to unmask any manifestation of an evil spirit, however plausible and pleasing such may appear to be. This if can also be used in counseling to know the name and nature of any evil that is possessing or attacking the counselee. And similarly, when seeking to expel demons from people by the authority of the name of Jesus. So the enemy chooses to use whoever, whatever, however, and by any means he can to tear down the church. He will try. And even if he must use the same Holy Ghost filled water baptized believer, if he find a loophole where he can use them, he will use them. Because it's this, this desire is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So it don't matter who you are, man, if, the, if, the, if you leave a loose thing loose and the enemy can hold on to it, he will come in to try to deceive. So God has given some people the gift of the discerning of spirit. And that is why many times when the service is going on, maybe don't everybody not have them head bowed. Some might be there because they are the watchman. Do are the, they are the one God has given this gift to watch out and to see when the enemy about to make his move because he loved to, to, to catch your off guard. He loved to come into to disrupt and cause confusion. And many times these persons, God have used them, man, to, 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 to uncover the plot of the enemy. In the last days, days there will be seducing spirits seeking to attack the church more than ever before. First Timothy 4 verse 1. And the presbyteries must seek to encourage the use of this gift to counteract the divisive wiles of the devil. We have to use it, brethren. We have to use it. We have to watch. So when we come to pray, we have to watch and pray. When we come and to worship, somebody has to be watching because the enemy we, we, without a notice, man, and we can come in and walk to create havoc. But blessed be the name of the Lord. God has set some in the church and has given the gift of the discerning of spirit. That is why when, when, the, when the apostles of old was walking, and the young lady was running before them and saying, these are the servants of God. Hear them. Man, it sounds so perfect. It sounds so right. Nobody could have any objection to what she was saying. But man, when you check it out, it was the devil. It was the work of the devil. And after a while, God's servant got annoyed and rebuked. Rebuke the devil out of her. And when you take a stock, it was an organized business. Oh my God. Jesus. I tell you, man. Okay, we have. We have two more. And I'm going to try to rush through them. The gift of divers kinds of tongues. Everyone baptized in the Holy Spirit should speak in tongues, unknown tongues. But, it, but that is not 
the gift referred to here. The tongues at baptism in the Holy Spirit are tongues of praise. Acts 2 verse 11. And they are certainly not preaching. They certainly are not preaching. For when it comes time to preach, Peter did not speak in tongues but in the language that the vast majority of his hearers had known from childhood. This gift is the ability to speak one or more unknown language, not in a praise, but as a message to the church, which is then received by the gift of the interpretation of tongues. The failure to distinguish between tongues as a sign of the as a sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the special gift of the different tongues for the church has led many Bible commentators into error. For whereas not all have the gift of tongues for interpretation, all who receive the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Our Holy Spirit speak with other tongues. So, when one is filled with this, becomes filled with the Holy Spirit, there is a tongues of praise. And I've heard and I've seen where some have even prophesied. But the speaking of tongues, diverse kind of tongues, is a message. To the church. But there must be one. Gifted. With the interpretation. Of these tongues. As with prophecy. The Holy Spirit has given direction. For the wise use of this gift. In the services of the gathered church. Here are some of them. The message in tongues. Should be divided by the person use into a maximum of three utterances. Also, a maximum of three persons can use, can exercise this gift in one service. There is a limit to what people can listen to. First Corinthians 14, verse 27 to 28. Second, one person should interpret the tongues not a crowd of different people all pressing in with their gifts. So it can be one person speaking in tongues and then four or five people rushing to interpret. Only one person should interpret. If there is no interpreter present, the channel should not give any tongues for interpretation. It is the duty of the presbyteries to see these instructions are carried out so that all things be done decently and in order and that visitors to the church don't think that the worshipers are insane. You see, the, 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 the Lord wants everybody to know. Sorry about that. Um, persons with these gifts should pray that they will also receive the gift of the interpretation of tongues. All right. Let's look at the gift of the interpretation of tongues. It should be noted that this is not the ability to translate a, a literal word-by-word -word reinstatement of a given message, but the ability But the ability to interpret the meaning and significance of the and significance of the import of the unknown language. This thus an interpretation can be shorter or longer than the message in tongues, depending on the way which the Holy Spirit 
wishes to unveil the tongues given. Persons having this gift must maintain a spiritually sensitive life in tune with the Holy Spirit as the use of this gift in distinction to all others involved being ready to respond when another is prompted by the Holy Spirit. Persons possessing this gift should not normally interpret their own message in tongues if they also possess that gift. So, I want to reread this particular part because I believe somebody is listening. Persons having this gift, the gift of interpretation of tongues, must maintain a spiritually sensitive life in tune with the Holy Spirit as the use of this gift in distinction to all others involves being ready to respond when another is prompted by the Holy Spirit. So this person must live so much before the Lord that when the other gift of the speaking in tongues becomes evident, they must be ready to respond, ready to be used by the Holy Spirit to interpret the, the tongues to the church. Persons possessing gifts, this gift should not normally, listen carefully, normally interpret their own message if they also possess that gift. If they have the gift for speaking in tongues, normally, how it should go, it is tongues spoken by one and interpreted by one. One person speaks in tongues, one person, another interpret in our own language. It normally, that's a normal way that it should be. But sometimes, sometimes the person would speak in tongues and then they would be, they would interpret. If there is nobody else there to do so. I see I'm way past my time, but let me close with this little bit of reading. All these gifts are used in the church, were used in the church at Corinth. And this was the pattern for all local churches. It may be necessary to the outworking of discipline in the local church to forbid persons to use the gifts, particularly if their behavior has shown a rebellious or carnal spirit. Persons who are not members are, reg are regular or regular adherent of the local church may only be permitted to exercise these gifts with the approval of the local presbytery. The proper use of these gifts in the local church is capable of bringing out great blessing and benefit to the whole church in the same way as to the health of every part of the human body contributes to the great, greatly to the robustness of the whole person. This is why we emphasize that they are for the church, which is his body. There are other there are other um there are other regarding to the church, but maybe next time we'll get into this. But you hear, brethren, the proper use of these gifts 
in the local church is capable of bringing out great blessing and benefit to the whole church in the same way as the health of every part of the human body contributes greatly to the robustness of the whole person. So, if a stranger come in our midst, we as the leaders can even stop them from prophesying because they must get approval from us. And people were not attending church regularly. Can just come turn up because them want them have a word of prophecy. It don't go like that. You must be in fellowship. You must stay in fellowship. Fellowship with the church. Fellowship with God. And then, and then after the, the, the presbytery has recognized this gift and given you okay, then you can exercise it. But you can't just walk around and feeling that may have prophecies or may have the, the champion gift, so therefore I'm unstoppable. No, it's not like that. The scripture says everything must be done decently and in order. I'll close here for now. And when next I get a chance, I will finish up on the, the other it's other five that is left. No. Yes, about five that is left. I'll finish up those next time. Over to Elder Ramsey.